Hello everybody, welcome to Dry Dock episode 137. This week the questions are taken from Guide 198 on the Russian battleship Imperator Nikolai I, and the Wednesday video, which was the first one in the Guadalcanal campaign series, the first battle of Savo Island. Lucid Nonsense asks, would the incomplete Imperator Nikolai I have made a suitable aircraft carrier conversion for the Black Sea or Mediterranean? So my initial reaction was, no, it's not a battle cruiser. it's not going to have the size, it's not going to have the speed. But then I remembered the period, i.e. immediately after World War I. And that's when you remember, well, the Royal Navy turned an Almirante La Torre class battleship into a Carrier H, Mess Eagle, and the French turned a Normandy class battleship, the Bairn, into, well, the Bairn. Um, so it's not entirely out of the question, and I mean, the US got along with Langley for a good while. So when you look at its overall speed and size, speed wise, well, it's kind of there along with all the other World War I capital ships. Lengthwise, which is probably one of the most important factors for uh, aircraft carriers' flight deck, it's somewhere between um, an Almirante La Torre class and Bern. Bern is the shortest of the three. Um, the Almirante La Torre type is the longest of the three. So, in theory, if they had stripped off most, if not all, of the armour, rebuilt this, obviously everything above the weather deck to become an aircraft carrier, not installing the main guns, etc. And possibly re-engined it in the mid-20s to take advantage of small tube boilers, thus getting it up to something like um, Eagle's top speed of around 24 knots. It wouldn't have been the world's best carrier, but it certainly would have been a carrier with a certain degree of functionality, um, assuming that they've managed to get through all of those refits, which, bearing in mind, 1920 Soviet Navy, probably very unlikely, but let's say for the sake of argument they manage it, and you get a 24-knot carrier based on the Imperator Nikolai Hull, it would be a reasonable enough vessel. Um, certainly be, I think, superior to Bern, um, if they aren't able to do those speed increases and it just remains at kind of its original speed plus or minus or not, then it's probably going to be somewhat similar to Bairn in capabilities. A lot of it's going to depend on how well the conversion goes, because at this point, remember, most people don't have that much experience building carriers. Uh, the French and the British have experience building seaplane carriers, and of course they're doing these very early conversions, which they're learning quite rapidly from. But it's not that much of an institutional knowledge advantage over everybody else. So the Russians could potentially pull off something fairly creditable. It's not going to be, as I say, a frontline competitive fleet carrier by World War Two, but I can see it fulfilling a roughly analogous role to uh, the kind of roles that HMS Eagle in the Mediterranean fulfilled for the Royal Navy. And then, of course, the Russians will also have to develop carrier-based aircraft, which would be quite interesting. Hibiki Nyan asks, You've always praised long-barrel guns for their performance, but I wonder about some of the cons of using them. High-velocity guns in battleships can have a lot of very good things to recommend them, but at the same time, there can be a lot of negatives associated with them, depending on how you build them. And some of those negatives can be things like very short barrel life, because a high-velocity gun, well, clues in the name, but it generally involves firing shells at considerably higher muzzle velocities than normal, which in turn means A, that shell is travelling through the rifling of the barrel faster, and also there's either more energy from a larger charge, or possibly a more energetic burn in terms of maybe using slightly higher grade explosives, which also leads to more energy in the barrel, but just via a slightly different method from piling on large amounts of normal explosives. And 
all of that can lead to increased barrel wear which shortens the lifespan of the gun and changes the ballistic properties of the gun ever so slightly to a slightly greater extent per shot than firing a gun normally does and obviously if you then go into a fight with a half or two-thirds worn down barrel that will affect both the velocity and accuracy of the shell itself which can lead to problems and also it's more expensive because as your ship goes through firing trials and battles etc you're going to need to be replacing those guns more often. You can also have accuracy issues from a number of other problems. If you build the gun too lightly, um, i.e. you just take say a 45 caliber weapon and extend it to 50, 52 or 55 calibers without really addressing uh, the additional energy that's going to be in there, you can get again also depending on how you build the gun not just in thickness but in terms of whether it's a uh, solid build up or wire wound um, different building methods are subject to this to a slight different degrees but you can get whipping of the gun and as the name suggests that involves the gun flexing somewhat during the discharge of the shell and of course that's going to lead to the gun being ever so slightly off because the shell's going to be thrown out at a slightly different trajectory to the one you're actually expecting because again the muzzle blast is going to be more powerful you can also end up with more in mutual interference between the shells because both the blast and the shockwaves of the shells travel are going to have more energy in them so you might have to introduce a bigger delay coil or space the guns out wider or something like that to address the accuracy problems your shells also have to be a little bit stronger because they're going to be generally impacting with more energy, which means they're going to have to not shatter themselves at slightly higher energy states than would be the case with most normal shells. And finally, at least for this wrap-up, although there are some other factors involved as well, you have to take even more care and attention when it comes to the quality control of the charges and shells that you're producing because a variance in velocity at, let's say, completely random arbitrary figures, but let's say at 2,000 feet per second, so a 1% error could lead to a variance of plus or minus 20 feet per second. Whereas if you're firing a shell at 3,000 feet per second, that same 1% error is a plus or minus variance of 30 feet per second. And if you've got one shell that's underperforming by that much, one shell that's overperforming by that much, then with your slower gun, the difference is 40 feet per second, which is going to lead to a certain degree of spread. With the higher performance weapon, that same percent error is going to lead to a 60 foot per second gap in performance, which is going to lead to a considerably greater spread. So whilst the barrel wear issue can be a problem, that much is, can be overcome simply by money paying for more barrels or barrel liners the main con of the high velocity gun is that you've got to find some way of addressing the multiple issues that surround it that could lead to significantly reduced accuracy but if you can overcome that then hey brilliant gun brian barriger asks assuming the russians did complete imperator nikolai by 1917 let's say how would a fight between the Nikolai and the yavuz dash Goben go down? Would a decisive naval engagement on the Black Sea have a major impact on the land campaign of the Anatolia Caucasus region? I'd actually chalk this one up most likely to actually end in favour of the Russians. The reason I say that is twofold. Firstly, by 1917, Goeben's condition, although it hasn't yet struck mines, which it would do in 1918, is not brilliant. And it's by the end of 16, early 1917, it's also suffering from fuel shortages, which keep it in port for a fair amount of time. So the seagoing experience of the crew diminishes somewhat. But on top of that, before 1917, Goben ends up in a gunfight with Emperatrista Ekaterina, I think that's how it's pronounced anyway, which is one of the diminutive um, battleships along the same design. So it's a smaller version of the design that would become Imperator Nikolai. And Goben 
basically tries to withdraw from that engagement. Um, it finds it quite difficult because, again, due to poor or lack of maintenance, it's not actually got all that much of a speed advantage, if at anything, over the Russian Dreadnought and only just about gets away. And given that Nikolai is bigger and better than the Imperatrista Maria um, dreadnoughts, it's going to have a similar kind of advantage combined with, I mean, not just that display, but given that the Russians will probably have to decommission some of their older ships to provide crews for it. You've also got to look at the performance of when Goban runs into a bunch of Russian pre-dreadnoughts that coordinate their fire. The Russian Navy, whilst very much on the back foot during a lot of the World War I campaign, is not something to be underestimated in a straight-up 1v1 ship fight. They're very determined, very motivated, and they've learned a lot from what happened to them in the Russo-Pacific, um, Russo-Japanese War in the Pacific, I should say, um, in 1905 their gunnery's got a lot better that's why you see things like slava taking on multiple german dreadnoughts so if they've taken experienced crews from some of the pre-dreadnoughts put them on imperator nikolai fully commissioned it it's brand new ready to go and it runs into goban in the state it was in 1917 i mean imperator nikolai already has more and better guns um Armour is kind of a wash, actually, fractionally in favour of Goban in some particulars. But speed is likely to be pretty much similar as well. At which point, yeah, Imperator Nikolai has the fight. Basically, it's it's, it's fight to lose, I would say. Benjamin Marsh asks, How long does it take to make an episode of The Dry Dock? Also, how much, if any, research do you do for The Dry Dock questions? It varies considerably from dry dock to dry dock, and within the dry dock it also depends on the type of questions that I pick. And when I go through the various questions that have been asked, I basically look for, has this question been asked before? Because if it has, then obviously I'm going to choose a different one. Is the question topical to the channel and ideally to the video in question? And... Can I give at least a half-decent answer in a few minutes? Because if it's a fairly detailed and in-depth question, I actually might take that and file it away for a potential future Wednesday video, rather than answering it in a very limited format there and then. Now, once I've got those questions, it's a matter of working out how much information I have to hand to answer them. If the questions are very largely on the topics of the video that they're taken from specifically, then generally I don't have to do too much more research to answer the dry dock question because it's usual that some or all of the information I need will have been something I've come across during my research for making that video in the first place. Uh, so for example in this uh, dry dock for instance with uh, quite a number of the questions from the Imperator Nikolai video being very specifically about the Imperator Nikolai it involves either situations or circumstances or technical abilities that I either came across or thought about while I was doing the research for that video so getting these questions down has not been too difficult whereas if it's a question that is relevant and topical and related to the video but not specifically about the contents of the video then it might take considerably longer so for some questions especially opinion based questions i can just read the question and go okay right i will answer it at which point to answer a question that ends up taking about five minutes in terms of audio might take only six or seven minutes to record, edit, etc. Whereas if it's a question about a very specific thing that's not directly related to the video and I haven't researched before, then I will have to go off and do some fairly extensive research about it. So in the production of a typical dry dock, I'd say it 
including editing time, it probably takes about three minutes for every one minute of dry dot content for the average question. Um, assuming, as I say, that there's the certain amount of research has already been done relevant to the original video. But when it comes to specific questions where I do have to go and do specific and in-depth research for that question in particular, I can be off doing research for quite a while. As in, I can be kind of saying, okay, I'm going to stop recording this dry dock, go off and do research and only come back to start recording that dry dock again several days later. <laughs> I mean, obviously not doing the research for several days end to end, but I'm doing the research off and on and looking through various books in between doing other things. So I'd say averaging it all out, it's you're probably looking at maybe a, something along the lines of a six to ten times multiplier on dry dock runtime to reflect the amount of time required to actually research and, and record and produce an episode of the dry dock. So your typically weekly dry dock probably represents two full working days. Um, and well, the Patreon dry docks, let's, let's not go into that. <laughs> oh boy. BK Zhang asks, given that the 16 inch 50 was intended to be specialized for deck penetration, but could only make deck hits at long ranges where even radar fire control wasn't able to hit reliably, is there a better argument for calling the 16 inch 45 caliber gun instead of the off type 16 inch 50 the best battleship gun in terms of design? And how do the Italian 15 and Japanese 18.1 inch guns compare to the 16 inch 45? I would tend to disagree with that, mainly on two bases. The first of which is that the 16 inch 45, as used on the North Carolinas and South Dakotas, as opposed to the 16 inch 50 used on the Iowas, used the Mark 8 Super Heavy AP shell the same as the Iowas did. So it's fairly difficult to work out would the 16 inch 45 have done better with conventional weight rounds in terms of general performance compared to the 16 inch 50 with mark 8s because the 16 inch 45 at least the mark 6 version that was on those fast battleships used the mark 8 ap round as well it never used a kind of standard weight ap round the 16 inch 45 on the colorados did but that's a different gun so it's a bit more difficult to draw comparisons at that point. And comparisons of the 16 inch 45 with the Italian 15 inch and the Japanese 18.1 similarly fall into this category of, well, the 1645 is using AP Mark 8, so there is that inherent limitation there. Um, but if you go with cal uh, penetration figures that are relatively consistent, i.e. all three based on the US Navy's formula for armour penetration, then at a range of around 20 to 21,000 yards, it suggests that the both the Japanese and the Italian guns have about two and a half to three inches additional penetration as compared to the 16 inch 45, which makes them superior weapons. But again, it depends on which figures you believe. If you go with other figures from other sources uh, including one or two based on official documents from the navy in question you either get lower values which would perhaps suggest that the italian 15 inch doesn't have a similar penetration to the 16 inch 45 with mark 8 in fact has maybe an inch or two less whereas other figures suggest that the Yamato's guns actually have considerably more penetration to getting into the order of about four inches more penetration. So it, it is a little bit variable there. And the thing is, with those kinds of official tables, you have to dig in a fair bit deeper to find out why there might be such a variance, because a traditional formula-based calculation might rely on the ship being broadside so at 90 degrees so the only angle you've got to worry about is the angle of fall whereas other penetration data that's based on um, 
official tests or various navies' official stances might be based on things like assume the battleship is at 30 degrees relative to you. So it's not a 90 degree impact, it's a 60 degree impact plus whatever angle of fall, etc. Um, plus also if someone's armour plate is better than another nation's armour plate, then if their official tests are run against their superior armour plate, they're going to have less penetration. And if that nation's armour plate is inferior in protective value to the US Navy's one, which is obviously what it bases its formula for armour penetration on generally, then you're going to be you're going to have the official figure showing greater penetration than the US formula would suggest. Now, the US formula can be adjusted to take into account the quality of various armour plates, but even then, even if you do adjust for a certain nation's uh, armour plate production capability and protection values, one, it's only ever going to be an estimate or an average, and if an official figure from the Navy in question is based on a test, well, that test has taken place physically against a certain type of a certain plate of armor that particular plate of armor may have over or underperformed or it might have performed pretty much spot on but there's not really any great way of knowing and so on and so on so you can get rough ideas but precise figures will always be a little bit fuzzy now as far as the original question about the 1650 versus the 1645 the other aspect of my disagreement is that the 1650 was designed for the AP Mark VIII, but you can change the way that gun is used. It's still a 50 caliber 16 inch gun. If they had decided to then go and develop a more standard weight 16 inch shell and slotted that in instead of the Mark VIII, they could still use the same charge and get a higher velocity and use it in a more conventional manner, in which case the side armor penetration values would have gone up into, well, not necessarily into the stratosphere, but certainly gone up to quite hilarious levels beyond that which the 16 inch 50 can already achieve. And that doesn't change anything about the gun, that's purely the shell. Um, and so, for that reason, I would say that pulling off a fairly reliable and fairly powerful 16 inch 50 design does make the US 16 inch 50 Mark 7 a superior gun to the 16 inch 45. It's just that it could have been, in, at least in my opinion, even more superior with a standard weight shell. USS Lexington CVA 16 asks, how good was USS Enterprise's helmsman, since from what I saw from Battle 360, she was able to evade torpedoes like it was going out of fashion? You know what? I was so, so glad to see this question pop up in chat, because it gives me an opportunity to show you this. This is a bit of footage from the US National Archives that I found and really wanted to include, because this is apparently original footage taken from USS Enterprise in the middle of the Battle of Santa Cruz. And... I found this about two days after I'd rendered the Battle of Santa Cruz video, and I was kicking myself because I could. I so desperately wanted to show this. Look at the lean on this ship. I mean, this is Enterprise under attack at various stages during the battle. There was a couple of uh, shots that actually show some of the bomb impacts happening as well, although I've cut those out for obvious reasons. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff showing post-battle uh, damage as well. But seriously... You just look at how fast this ship is turning. You can see from the men here that, okay, some of the footage has been um, obviously taken at a lower FPS and then put to standard film FPS, but still, you can see the wake of this ship just literally exit stage left here. And at various points, you can see this poor old crashed wildcat um, tipping and turning with the way the ship's maneuvering. And later on as we go through on through this you'll see some of the see there you go ship uh, the uh, plane tips over and the anti-aircraft guns are opening up and the enterprise's helmsman if he didn't get a medal and a very high re level one i would dearly like to know why but there's a near miss um, you can see the japanese if if they would have scored a hit if this guy hadn't been right on his on the ball i mean this is a 
Yorktown class carrier and he's basically doing the Tokyo Drift with a full-size fleet carrier and uh, and then people wonder how the heck did Enterprise survive apart from being insanely tough well I have a feeling this guy whoever he was helming the Enterprise really really had some skills on him and it seems Enterprise was blessed with a whole series of incredibly skilled crewmen you've got the the officer who's writing all the gunnery reports whose extracts you've heard in various Guadalcanal campaign videos you've got the helm officer who you can see here is is doing a mixture of the Tokyo Drift and the, and a ski slope slalom using his carrier. You can see all the escorts just appearing and disappearing from the field of view. And, of course, you've also got whoever the person who shot this footage is, who, bear in mind, I mean, look, there's things on fire all over the place. There's anti-aircraft guns going off, etc. And he's just sitting there quite happily at the back of the superstructure with a film camera going, yep, yeah, clearly this is what I want to be doing in the middle of an active battle and to be fair holding his camera relatively steady I suspect there's a tripod in there somewhere helping um, but yes yeah, so you can see there's a uh, the uh, five inch guns on the side there and this is after one of the bomb hits so you can see all the uh, damage control crew going on and briefly pausing in my praise of Enterprise's helmsman. Let's just take a look at some of these damage control efforts here. The ship's still manoeuvring. Yeah, there's oh, there's the other bomb hole. Um, that's uh, not a pleasant place to have been, to be perfectly honest. But these guys are out on deck, undertaking damage control, at this point mostly firefighting, whilst the absolute lunatic in charge of the helm is throwing the ship all over the place. You saw earlier, the ship's basically, at various points, healing so hard they're having to walk as if they're walking uphill. So this isn't easy. I mean, the ship's not stopping if one of them slips, trips, or otherwise loses their balance. They're just going to roll down the side and hope they get caught in one of the gun tubs. But they're pressing on with their damage control efforts. You can see one of these hoses here um being played out uh, to try and address that rather annoying fire in the stern but throughout all of this you rarely if ever actually see the f full extent of the ship's wake trailing just back straight off the stern most of the time the ship's wake is disappearing one way or the other or showing a kind of snake-like s-bend and yeah, here we go over to one side again. I mean, this guy's pulling the carrier in such a tight turn, the smoke from the fire is exiting stage left rather than directly aft off the stern as it was earlier. So, yeah, um, there's some patching going on. Presumably one of the hose pipes has sprung a leak for some description. But yeah, hopefully that gives you some idea. How good was USS Enterprise's helmsman? He was damn good. Primark359 asks in regard to the First Battle of Savo Island, if carriers were present, would they have been in any danger? And how many escorts were left with them? And could those escorts have made a significant contribution? So Fletcher's total force, if you add in all three carriers, so Wasp, Enterprise and Saratoga, between them have the escort of North Carolina battleship, plus three of the New Orleans-class heavy cruisers, two of the Portland-class heavy cruisers plus Atlanta, and 16 destroyers of varying classes. In terms of could those have made a difference to the First Battle of Savo Island, well, in terms of sheer numbers, sure, obviously, if you chose to strip the carriers of their entire escort, but let's face it, that's not going to happen. Also, not all carriers are the same distance from Savo Island anyway so if you maybe leavened the force that was standing up off of uh, Savo Island with a detachment from the escort well it might have made a difference in as much as there'd be so many targets that the Japanese couldn't kill all of them before some of the other ships got up into um, firing positions and action and got up to action stations but at the same time given that the US forces the allied forces um, were caught completely unawares by the Japanese attack I think most realistic scenarios where you put 
some of the carrier escort group in with those forces, you're just going to end up with more allied losses. Maybe you end up with one or two additional Japanese losses, but it, the butcher's bill is going to be far higher on the allied side than it is going to be on the Japanese side, which is not particularly a great outcome, especially since it robs the carriers of valuable escorts, which might then lead to the loss of carriers further down the line due to lack of sufficient anti-air cover which is obviously very much not a good thing as far as would the carriers have been any danger well if assuming they stayed back off of on their flight stations presumably not because the japanese surface units didn't come anywhere near them there is of course a small possibility that if the carriers had been around and news of the disaster had at uh, first Sav island had gotten back to them in time during the early morning hours they could have run forward preparations made for launch at first light and maybe caught macau's force as it was retreating back up north but that would be a rather outlier event beige thursday asks my great uncle cyril james chard was on hms prince of wales when she sank his rank was oa1c I was told he was on one of the turrets. What happened to the crew that were picked up after the sinking, and how would I find out if he was on Prince of Wales during the Battle of the Denmark Strait? So the crew that survived the sinking of HMS Prince of Wales, along with the crew that survived the sinking of HMS Repulse during the uh, sinking of Force said, were picked up by destroyers that had been accompanying them. Uh, in this case, you can see... HMS Express actually alongside Prince of Wales taking off crewmen before Prince of Wales ends up listing so much that the destroyer has to pull back and start fishing people out from the water instead. Now, as far as finding out if your great uncle was on Prince of Wales during the Battle of the Denmark Strait, what I would recommend is going to the government's website, the UK government's website, and finding the details for requesting uh, your great uncle's war records now i've gone over this a couple of times before but it bears repeating because it can be quite useful and it's been a while since this kind of question has come up you are obviously not the direct next of kin so you've got to work out firstly does did your great uncle have any kids because the first step they're going to say is are you direct descendants if not have you got consent from immediate next of kin so if your great uncle was married and his wife is still alive that would be her if he had any children that would be them so if any of those next of kin exist you would need to get their permission um, and have it ready for the application if not then either your mother or father whichever side of the family he's on would then be the next next of kin so you'd have to get their permission um and so on down the line uh until eventually you get to yourself being the most immediate next of kin then you give them as many details as possible in the next of kin's records um pdf download and send that off to them and then hopefully they'll send you back any and all copies and information of your great uncle's uh, service records that they have and then within that you'll want to be looking for his dates of assignment to particular ships and if his his date of assignment to HMS Prince of Wales predates the Battle of the Denmark Strait and any assignment however temporary to another ship post dates that battle then there's a good chance that he was aboard Prince of Wales for the Battle of the Denmark Strait. And given Prince of Wales's overall relatively short career, it's entirely possible, although obviously without seeing the service records, I couldn't say 100%, that he might have been part of the original crew assigned to the ship on its commissioning and might well have stayed with the ship all the way through to the time that it was sunk. But this is what the records um, will show you. So hopefully that's helpful. If you need any further help, uh, dealing with that do drop me a line on discord or via email and i'm more than happy to help out shoot me asks i was reading the book shattered sword when i came across a description of a light assisted landing system on japanese carriers that bears some resemblance to the optical landing system used today i was always told this was a british invention but this looks to not be the case 
Is this a case of parallel evolution that the English-speaking world didn't know about due to the language barrier, or a completely different system that just looks like the later system but is unconnected? It's a similar system in principle, but slightly less advanced and of a slightly different nature to what would become the optical landing system, which is the basis of carrier landings today. So to provide the basic rationale of the difference, the optical landing system uses a mirror, which is then gyro-stabilized to account for the pitch and roll of the ship with separate lights as your standard um, line up lights. And so as long as that mirror is stabilized, it can point down a completely fixed glide path and the pilot can look at that and can see by how the single light in the middle, uh, the a ball light, which can be then seen, is it above or below the line of green lights or on the dot, which is what you want. And from that, he can work out, is he on a, the correct glide path or not? The key advantage of that is that it's completely stabilized and independent of the movement of the ship, uh, because obviously going through the air, the pilot is not going to want to jump around and roll his aircraft to try and mirror exactly what the ship is doing. The Japanese system, which you can see here in this um, colorized photo, uses two sets of lights mounted to the ship. And the idea is, again, to get them in a specific alignment and then you're on the correct glide path. The limitation of this system, as opposed to the optical landing system that was invented by the British and is now in use today, is that it's fixed to the ship. So if the ship is going nice and steady, fantastic. If the ship is rolling and pitching quite considerably, then you have more of a problem because although the lights can be adjusted for different glide paths, they can't be constantly adjusted the way the OLS can to account for what the ship's doing. So you might be on a fairly good glide path, but if the ship hits an unexpected wave and pitches somewhat, that's going to throw the alignment of the lights out, at which point the pilot has to kind of make a decision. Is he actually on the correct glide path? And should he continue on that? Or was he perhaps on the wrong glide path before? Perhaps was the ship pitching down a particularly long wave and he actually does need to correct? It's difficult to determine in the uh, few seconds you have coming in for a carrier landing. So th this is the complication of it and why it's not quite as advanced a, a system. Plus, it's also down a certain amount to judgment because it's to do with overlapping two what to the pilot are sets of lights that might completely overlap or go above or below. So there's a certain amount of interpretation involved. There's like, are they precise? Is it sort of precisely one light bar above the other or is it half above, half below, etc, uh, etc. Et Whereas with the OLS system, because the ball light that you're looking at is in alignment with but separate to the data lights, then you can tell fairly easily it should be in complete alignment and the minute it drifts that's much easier to, to work out. So similar, not identical and not as advanced, but still a, a pretty good solution with all that being said, especially given that it's a system that the Japanese came up with pre-World War II. So you, you do have to account for these kinds of things in as much as there is a lot of convergent evolution when it comes to carriers. I mean, just look at the early forms of Akagi and Kaga versus the early forms of Courageous, Glorious and Furious, and actually forms that they retain for quite a while, with the curved forward flight decks. You'd look at them and think, well, surely what someone is copying the other. Not really. They're almost entirely independently developed. Dr. End asks, just how effective was the coastal submarine arm of various major navies? Oh, uh, <laughs> yet another question to which there is a somewhat difficult answer. It depends vastly on not only which country, but also how you define a coastal submarine. A coastal submarine is usually, by necessity, a defensive weapon. So nations that 
don't really end up having to defend their own coastline all that much generally don't have very successful coastal submarine arms if they have them at all uh, for example you're not going to hear the uh, great and glorious tales of the u.s coastal submarine arm for obvious reasons but equally just because a coastal submarine is designed to be small and ideally better suited at shallow work and perhaps not of the world's greatest range, that doesn't preclude them from operating in some rather interesting environments beyond their own immediate waters. For example, German coastal submarines in World War I and World War II would find themselves in various parts of the Mediterranean and even the Black Sea, in once or twice parts of the Baltic, partly because they could be dismantled and transported by rail and reassembled in other theatres that Germany had access to, if not necessarily direct sea access from its ports. And other times they would venture beyond their waters to operate in enemy coastal waters, such as off the British coast, because it wasn't too far away. And, well, a coast is a coast. If they're designed to operate in those kind of environments, they'll probably do equally as well on the enemy's coastline as they will on a friendly coastline. So German coastal submarines definitely got a fairly good showing. The Italian sub coastal submarines also got a fairly good showing, but when it comes to both Italian and British coastal subs, this is where the how do you define a coastal sub comes into play. Because generally what you'd classify as the oceanic type uh, submarine tends to, although not strictly, especially by the, but by the time of World War II, generally you're looking at a sub of above 800 tonnes surface displacement, usually maybe a bit more, um, although in the case of the Type 7, early Type 7 U-boats, that could be eh, on the margin. Um, but when you are looking at submarines below that weight, are they coastal subs because they're not as big as the oceanic subs or are they just small submarines uh, for example the british s class submarines and also the u class submarines of world war ii they're both very small subs compared to something like a t class but they don't see all that much service off the british coast they do so do some activities off the British coast, but you find an awful lot of them in the Mediterranean and operating off the French coast. The French coast because of its coast, and in the Mediterranean because it's generally shallow, confined waters which are very similar to coastal operations, and why, for a number of reasons, they tend to do better than the bigger fleet-style submarines. The Italians, are obviously, are they operating in the Mediterranean, so... In terms of operational environment, a coastal sub or a fleet sub, the, the operational set part of the underwater experience is not that much different whether they're right off the Italian coast or in the middle of the Med, for all intents and purposes, outside of slight issues surrounding range. So then do you start classifying Italian small submarines as coastal submarines, as Mediterranean theatre submarines, and then maybe you classify the Italian mini subs as their only coastal subs? It's it's a bit all over the place. But if you just take a more general viewpoint that subs are maybe six, seven hundred tons um, surface displacement or less count as coastal subs, then both the British and Italian coastal, quote unquote, submarines have fairly interesting and active careers in the Mediterranean. The Japanese tend not to have too much success with their coastal types. Obviously they do have the really, really tiny mini subs that they use occasionally. They do have some coastal subs that do a relatively decent amount of work, but because of the sheer size of the Pacific, most of the subs that they have that ha get most of the activity and the kills in tend to be their larger vessels because by the time you get to a point that the Allies are pressing in close enough for their properly coastal subs to actually be within range and have relevance, the Allied anti-submarine efforts have also ramped up massively. So whilst Japanese coastal submarines do have some fairly exciting careers, they tend to be also relatively short. Hundertdampf asks, who decides the prefixes that the navies use? 
why would, for example, the Danish use HMDS, considering it sounds like the Royal Navy was superior? Was everyone lazy and just copy the British? So ship prefixes can fall broadly into four main categories. And boy, do some people get really, really kind of throwing their toys out of the pram level of angry over some of them. Uh, to the point that some people who I would charitably describe as more mouth than brains like to arbitrarily and blanketly dismiss entire uh, books or historians purely on the basis of them using a prefix that they personally don't like, usually without doing any degree of actual checking into why that person is using that particular prefix. But minor rant aside, the four categories that prefixes usually come under are either one, the quote-unquote native prefix of the country. So the easy ones and obvious ones are things like HMS for the Royal Navy, his Maj or Her Majesty's ship, and USS for the US Navy United States ship. So if they are in use by the Navy and they're fairly well known, they tend to be used. The second category comes under ship prefixes where a nation may use a prefix, but for whatever reason, internationally, which basically means in English, because apparently that's the international language, um, it's for whatever reason altered. So in your example um, of the Danish ships, internally the Danish use KDM, which, and I apologise to any Danish listeners, is something along the lines of Königliga Danska Marina. Hopefully that's something close to reality, which basically is, um, if you literally translated it into English, would be, I guess, King of, uh, or Queen maybe, of Denmark's marine vessel. But for whatever reason, that gets turned into HDMS, or his Danish Majesty's ship, or her Danish Danish Majesty's ship, for use in general in the general English-speaking world, and where the country in question has a monarchy and is using that as part of their designation, the reason for the British getting HMS and everyone else getting H insert um, letter in favour of country here, MS, tends to be partly because the Royal Navy has an age seniority over almost all other navies, and also the Royal Navy at the time that most of this stuff was being put together was the world's biggest navy. So a combination of those two factors, they kind of got claimed dibs on the HMS part. And you can see that in both arrangements. So you can see his or her, insert country type, Majesty's ship, or his or her Majesty's insert country type ship so you could have um, obviously his or her Danish Danish Majesty's ship or his or her Netherlands Majesty's ship which is for the um, Royal Dutch or Royal Netherlands Navy but you can also have uh, like say with the Australians or the Canadians his or her Majesty's Canadian ship his or her Majesty's Australian ship then you have ship prefixes which are official but not internally used by the Navy in question because the Navy in question doesn't have prefixes. So this is more of a modern thing, especially when it comes to something like, uh, say, let's say NATO. And so, for example, the German Navy at the moment doesn't use prefixes, but there is an official NATO designation, FGS, for them. Similarly, France in its current iteration, doesn't use prefixes, but they get FS for um, their ships, French ship and or Federal German ship in both cases, because that makes it easier to identify them for large-scale exercises. So those are official designations, but not official designations as far as the Navy in question is concerned. They're just there as handles to help with um, external international cooperation. And then finally, we get to prefixes which are entirely made up, effectively. And 
you can see these in occasionally a few modern navies as the way of designating things where those navies don't actually tend to cooperate with much of anyone else so they don't tend to need uh, an official international prefix anyway um, but also much more so with historical navies so for example the German navy at the time of World War II the Kriegsmarine did not use any prefixes and obviously they <laughs> weren't in the habit of cooperating with all that many people in their uh, main operational environment so there wasn't any agreed international prefix for them either but in order to help differentiate them from other vessels that might share the same name for example in the imperial german navy which did use sms which is the german equivalent of hms you have ships like blucher scharnhorst neisenor etc and so many iterations of Königsberg, um karlsruhe etc and in the kriegsmarine there were ships that carried these names as well uh, emden is another good one and so to try and help distinguish which of these ships you're talking about and also because um, sometimes it can look a bit odd if you say HMS this, USS that, no space proof for prefix Bismarck. Um, for both of those reasons various historians do sometimes like to use either KMS or which is technically Kriegsmarine ship or DKM, uh, Deutsches Kriegsmarine, for classifying Kriegsmarine era vessels. Now, straight up, there is no historical basis for doing this. The Germans didn't do it. Um, no one at the time used it, but it's a useful handle, um, as I say, to help prevent confusion with older ships and also just to kind of give a, a uniformity of designation sometimes um, in charts and tables. And so some historians do it. Some use KMS, some use DKM, some historians don't. All approaches are fairly valid, in my opinion, as long as everyone acknowledges that, yeah, in fact, this is an ease of handling method and not a an attempt to sort of retroactively impose some kind of historicity on those titles. And you'll notice in my videos, I do use KMS in that manner pretty much for the ease of searching, because as you will know, I've done videos on the Kriegsmarine ship Scharnhorst and the Imperial German Navy ship Scharnhorst. So if I just put Scharnhorst, okay, fair enough, maybe the uh, thumbnail might give it away, but just from a search perspective, it's just easier to say KMS Scharnhorst, then everyone knows, ah, oh, right, yes, he's talking about the World War II Scharnhorst, as opposed to SMS Scharnhorst, which is the uh, World War I Scharnhorst. So that's my reasoning. And the same thing with the Japanese Navy. They're technically technically there's a certain amount of designation within um japanese world war ii records but there's no official title for it so sometimes you see people using hijms which is his imperial japanese majesty's ship or some people just use ijn for imperial japanese navy um again so, well there's possibly a very slight argument to be made for hijms as a translation of a japanese designation but still not something that was you know, painted on the side of the ship um but broad it falls into the same kind of thing as dkm or kms it's a useful way of identifying who the ship belongs to but without any claim at historical authenticity so yeah that's um ship prefixes for you Minko Leitnen asks, what is the most successful naval bombardment in naval history? It's going to depend how you measure effectiveness, because over time, what's an acceptable target has changed quite dramatically, as well as the nature of warfare. Troops and generally have become much less concentrated, fortifications become a lot tougher, um, ranges of engagement and until the advent of guided munitions therefore accuracy have changed quite considerably so you've also got to take into account the amount of effort invested how long does the bombardment take how much of the fleet does it occupy how, what are the goals etc so you could look at some of the absolutely massive bombardments that were undertaken 
towards the end of World War II, especially in the Pacific theatre. But whilst to varying degrees they had certain levels of success and in some areas were very successful at pulverising certain elements of the Japanese defences, in other parts not so much, ultimately they were massive bombardments that were part of a objective which was a subset of a campaign which was a subset of a war so no matter how perfect they were even if they met 100 percent of their objectives whilst that might count as successful on a tactical level you've got to consider the strategic level and that in turn means that if you really want to look at both tactics and strategy you're probably going to have to look at something in the age of sail at which point it becomes something of a difficult one to call because in the age of sail target selection was a little bit freer so in world war one and world war two indiscriminate naval shelling of civilian population centers would not generally have been considered viable german shelling of scarborough and etc aside but in the age of sail whilst it was not necessarily viewed as desirable no one was shedding any particular tears if random rockets or shells went into a bit of a crossfire and set fire to civilian areas of a city and in some cases that might be an unspoken or even a spoken intention um so when you look at that kind of thing then those kind of bombardments really come to the fore one example and i'm not saying this is the most successful but certainly probably in terms of overall effectiveness ranks as one of the most successful would be the second british attack on copenhagen during the napoleonic wars in 1807 because the first battle of copenhagen was a very long drawn out naval duel between nelson's fleet and um the danish fleet whereas the 1807 um, engagement consisted of a large-scale bombardment of Copenhagen primarily supposedly of military installations but also a fair amount of fire hitting the general city and over the course of less than 24 hours it basically flipped Denmark from a potentially hostile nation with a reasonable sized fleet to a neutralized nation and the Royal Navy having a bunch of brand new ships of the line and frigates that it could make use of if it so chose without actually having to engage in a massive naval battle or indeed a massive land battle so it knocked an entire country effectively out of the war and gained the british a whole basically a new small fleet at relatively minimal cost and relatively quickly so on a strategic level that's a hugely successful bombardment um and there are there are probably one or two others that come up to a similar level. But hopefully that provides something of the answer that you're looking for. Edward Franklin Woods asks, I've often heard that by the end of World War II, the two largest navies in the world were the US Navy and the US Navy Reserve Fleet. What is the truth of this? Strictly at the very end of World War II, no, there isn't a lot of truth to that. The US Navy was definitely the largest navy in the world at the end of World War II. But the Royal Navy was in a very strong second place. You do see photos like this one, for example, of massive US fleets in mothballs. But these are more towards the end of the 1940s. Because apart from anything else, whilst there were an awful lot of ships that the US very rapidly put into reserve after World War II, the Atlantas, for example, a lot of the light carriers... As you can see here, lots of destroyers, a lot of their older cruisers, etc., a number of their older battleships. At the exact end of World War II, pretty much all of those were still in service, and a very large number would stay in service at least for a few months doing things like Operation Magic Carpet, shipping troops home, etc. So at the day that the uh, peace treaty was signed aboard the deck of USS Missouri marking the end of World War II with the surrender of Japan the Royal Navy was the second largest navy in the world you can make a relatively good argument that by the end of the 1940s the US Navy and the US Navy Reserve Fleet were the two largest na navies in the world because the Royal Navy numbers had fallen off dramatically over the course of those four to five years 
but not at the exact end of the Second World War. Nickboy302 asks, Whose navy was stronger for their time, the Royal Navy at the end of the Napoleonic Wars or the US Navy at the end of World War II? Uh, for the time period, probably the Royal Navy at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and that's largely for the reason, ironically enough, of the Royal Navy at the end of World War II, because whilst the Royal Navy did fight alongside allies during the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy didn't fight alongside any allies that had a fleet that came even close to matching its. All the people who had really big fleets, I mostly the French and the Spanish, ended up on the opposite side of the British, and so with their navies somewhat broken down and um, largely in the service of the Royal Navy, weirdly enough, um, proportionally the Royal Navy was far stronger and obviously in an era where sheer brute skill of the crews in terms of sailing experience and gunnery experience could factor in a lot more to a certain degree, I would say, than it did at the end of World War II. Um, that's not to say that crew experience in World War II doesn't matter, it's just that a green but trained crew in World War II will still be able to operate a technologically sophisticated ship to a reasonable level of competence, whereas a green crew in the Napoleonic era would be at a much more substantial disadvantage versus a veteran crew. But anyway, um, basically because those two fleets had been worn down and the Royal Navy were just so much larger, it had a dominance that was basically unrivaled for a considerable period of time. The US Navy had a similar kind of position over the people it fought, but because it fought alongside the Royal Navy as its ally, then it meant that whilst the US Navy was the preeminent navy by the end of the Second World War by a considerable margin, the Royal Navy, with its size and the number of ships and power that it had, was proportionally considerably more powerful than any of the rivals to the Royal Navy at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, obviously, Britain and America had no particular interest or chance of fighting each other immediately after the Second World War, and that worked to its benefit, both sides benefit, because obviously then as NATO formed, you ended up with the two largest navies in the world cooperating together, at least until... Uh, Britain decided to cut the Royal Navy down massively and the Russians decided to build the Soviet Navy up massively, but that's another story for another channel. And finally for this week, Matt Kidd asks, are the Hood survivors the luckiest warship disaster survivors? They are certainly up there. I mean, to be on Hood, it blows up, it sinks, you're one of the few to actually get off the ship, you get sucked down with the ship and then an explosion, whether it be the forward magazines or boilers or whatever, creates a bubble that pops you back to the surface and then you survive the North Atlantic cold long enough for someone to pick you up. Bearing in mind there were ice packs not more than a few dozen miles away. Um, that is truly a spectacular amount of luck. <laughs> However, there are a number of other sailors who have almost equally spectacular survival stories to tell. I mean, there's one guy whose ongoing run of bad dash good luck is almost legendary, which is uh, Kit Wickham Musgrave. He was aboard HMS Abu Kir when it was torpedoed. He swam over to Hogue, then it was torpedoed. He swam over to Cressy, then it was torpedoed. And then he managed to stay afloat and get picked up and taken home, where he joined HMS Vanguard. And then a couple of years later, went on leave. And a few days later after that, a magazine, a magazine aboard Vanguard detonated, destroying her in harbour. Uh, having decided that clearly he was pretty much invulnerable, he then decided to serve aboard one of the few remaining I-class battle cruisers, the Inflexible, for the rest of the war. Uh, and then chose submarines, also known for being a really, really safe haz uh, hazard posting, obviously. Um, yeah, he survived all that and then went back into war in World War II and survived that as well. So there's some incredible luck. But if I was ever going to pick someone who was had the single greatest luck of any sailor that I know of, 
I'm going to have to point to uh, Royal Marine gunner Brian Gasson. He was aboard HMS Invincible, as you might have guessed from the picture. And he wasn't just anywhere aboard HMS Invincible. He was in Q-Turret, which means he was in the turret, mounting the rangefinder, when it took the hit that caused this. At the time of this photo, Royal Marine Gunner Brian Gasson is pretty much dead centre in this photo. And yes, that means he is literally inside that socking great fireball as the magazines detonate. Somehow, beyond all sane sense of reason and probability, he survived. Partly because the rangefinder compartment in the turret was a separate section to the gun compartment in the turret, so he wasn't exposed directly to the flash fire. But still, he literally rode an entire battlecruiser magazine explosion out without much injury. And then, as the ship sank, floated out the top of the turret into the ocean as one of only six survivors and made his way over to the ship that was eventually picking him up. Um, quite how did he manage this? I, I genuinely baffled, but he did. So, yeah, we, we need, obviously need just to clone him and put him on as many warships as possible, because if several hundred tons of cordite literally detonating under his feet couldn't kill him, I struggle to imagine what can. And that wraps us up for this week. Uh, not a lot of channel admin at the moment. It's raining here in the UK, as it typically is. And, uh, well, I've got my Dulux chart of varying shades of grey out to see what today's weather is like. And today's cloud cover most closely matches Grey Steel 2, if you ever happen to want to paint your bedroom or other living spaces ceiling in a colour reminiscent of early March 2021 UK skies. But in perhaps more relevant news, there is a new album of photos up on the website drakinafell.co.uk, uh, courtesy of a gentleman whose father took most of them. Um, there's quite a few interesting ones there, I think, and they're all in a very, very high quality. Uh, there's a few articles there as well, so if you want to check those out, please do so. And there will be a significant number of updates coming in terms of uploads of, of photos on the site in the next few months now that I have some more time on my hands. All right, thank you very much.